Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Or good day, mates. Actually, this isn't a good day, mate talk. Well, it is because we've got a lot of Aussies and we're just leaving Australia. So anyway, good day, mates. Uh, I realize this is really early. I know in your bodies it's still only 8.45, but I'm glad you're here. Anyway, today's presentation is a little different because I'm going to talk about the, de uh, what, the early version of the destination we're on, ships. Okay, so it's going to be about the early days and some of my favorite explorers and some of their adventures on the seas. So let's turn the clock back quite a ways back, and I want you to sit back as we sail into history. Originally, man was driven to sea by the need for food. Soon he wanted more territory, but eventually humans just liked to travel. They wanted to have cruise ships very early, no, not really. Anyway, thousands of years ago, man used whatever materials were available to him for floating devices. Boats and rafts were made of sticks and logs, and later the log became a simple dugout canoe. This particular canoe I photographed about 3,000 years ago, in the very early days of travel. Anyway, water vessels uh, developed into many varieties depending on the needs of the people. Ancient boats carried just one or two people. They weren't really that big, and generally people traveled coastal routes, not straying very far from shore. Uh, paddles eventually evolved into oars, and what that meant basically was it went from being handheld to being attached to the hull. Uh, and then someone got the bright idea of trying to catch the wind in the sails. Among the first recorded uses of sail was in the Mediterranean and the Aegean seas. Egyptian and Greek craft were powered by basic sails, but slave oarsmen really were the most common means of powering their boats. Oh, by the way, did you hear this one? Uh, a slave master on a Roman galley uh, made an announcement one evening that just thrilled the slaves. He said, I have some really good news. Tonight we're going to give you all double rations and you're going to be able to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Not only that, tomorrow morning you don't even have to get up until 10 a.m. and we're going to give you triple rations for breakfast. Oh, the slaves were thrilled. They were cheering and jumping up and down and they were just beside themselves. And then he said, but I also have some bad news because tomorrow afternoon the emperor wants to go water skiing. <laughs> this is a Greek trireme. Actually, it's a computer gra graphic of a Greek trireme. And both the Greeks and the Romans used these ships for war as well as for commerce. Some of them carried hundreds of men and with as many as three or four levels of oar. Now you can figure out how difficult it was to synchronize all of that when you had four levels of oarsmen. Uh, but it was pretty easy because they were all slaves. Anyway, there was some use of sail, uh, and that design really lasted until the 14th century when it was still being used by the Venetians. Now, it had a pointed bow at the water line, and that pointed bow was its ramming bow, and that was its primary weapon for use in war. It was right at the water line of the enemy vessel, so it would cause them to sink. And also, the, they had one oar that they moved to the back end, and that's where the steering oar was. And that was generally located on the right side of the ship because most of the people at the time, as is also true today, were right-handed. And that side of the ship became known as the steerboard side. Later it was called starboard side. Norse boats were long and narrow and that made them very suitable for ocean crossings. And they also had a shallow draft and could easily enter rivers, small streams, or even be pulled up onto the shore. A shallow draft means that the boat doesn't sink very deep in the water, so it was a pretty shallow, low vessel. It also didn't have a very big freeboard, meaning it didn't stick very much high out of the water. The Vikings of Scandinavia traveled vast distances in these very long boats. They sailed to Iceland, Greenland, and North America. And they proved their ocean-going expertise by raiding also much of Europe and Asia. They accomplished this over a thousand years ago in spite of the harsh weather of the North and the fact that they had no cabins and no heat on board their ships. Sandpans came into use about the same time in history as the Vikings, but they were a world away. Now, sandpans are still used today by rural residents across Southeast Asia. It's always been a wooden boat. Usually in the olden days, it was 12 to 15 feet long. The word sandpan comes from the original Cantonese term for a boat. It literally meant three planks. Uh, Basically, the name referred to a hull design, consisted of a large flat bottom made from one plank, 
joined to the two sides that were one plank on each side. A junk is a Chinese sailing ship. The uh, design is still in use today. They were very efficient, very sturdy ships. They were quite a bit larger than most of the ships in the, in the West. Junks had technical advantages in their sail and in their hull designs. And you can note that we've started to see a, a much greater use of sail for open water travel. Junks were first developed during the Han Dynasty, about 220 BCE, for coastal and river transportation. And then within 100 years, they were used as ocean-going vessels. On the high seas, a junk was better adapted than many Western ships. And today, they're still found throughout Southeast Asia and India, but most common in China. Outrigger canoes were originally developed by the people of Southeast Asia for sea travel and transportation. Their boats had a second or sometimes a third small balancing hull out to the side of the main hull, and that gave them excellent stability in the open water. That hull design later evolved into what we know of today as catamarans. Now, Southeast Asian uh, people were superb navigators. They traveled eastward to Polynesia and New Zealand and westward across the Indian Ocean as far as Madagascar. The Polynesians populated islands across the Pacific but there was some controversy as to whether and how it was done. The sister of Kantiki, shown here, is located in a museum in Norway. The raft was built in 1947 by the Norwegian Tor Heyerdahl. He wanted to prove his theory that Polynesia was populated by pre-Columbian Indians from South America. He speculated that they arrived on rafts made from reeves. Heyerdahl's idea was based on the winds and the currents in the Pacific and the results of his voyage seem to prove the concept. However, modern DNA has shown that theory to be false. It's widely believed today that Polynesia was populated from west to east. Their genes say the Polynesians were from Indonesia, not from South America. Civilization developed as more and more commerce was undertaken between cities and countries. Later routes to the east, such as the Silk Road, were time-consuming, dangerous, and often controlled by unfriendly factions and countries. There came a much greater reliance on sea travel. Ships had reached levels of technology that allowed voyages of longer duration, covering vast amounts of what was the, quote, known, unquote, world. The age of seafaring Europeans was awakening. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the explorers who paved the way. Prince Henry the Navigator was the son of King John I and Queen Philippa of Portugal. He was born in 1394. He was a dreamer, a scholar, and a monk who had the instincts of a really good business person. Henry was also a man of great virtue who never allowed any poor person to leave his presence empty-handed. He was described as a very calm individual who spoke softly and desired no luxuries, at least no luxuries for himself. Hearing of great wealth in distant countries, Henry founded a school of navigators, and he employed map makers or cartographers to help him map the coast of Africa. Shown here is a monument to the navigators, also known as Prince Henry's Monument in Lisbon, Portugal. And it has all of the people that work for him below him on the monument itself. Now, while he was instrumental in fostering exploration and discovery, Prince Henry essentially never went to sea himself. He always sent somebody else. I don't know if it was because he got seasick or just he had the ability to do it. Anyway, Prince Henry encouraged his father to conquer the city of Soweto, a Muslim port in what is today known as Morocco. It presented a very unique opportunity because many trade uh, caravan routes ended there. The, the potential for profit and wealth was great. They entered Soweto in 1415, and the city quickly fell to the Portuguese. They found maps there that were much more accurate than the ones they already had. Jews who were allowed more freedom of movement in North Africa had made those maps. It's interesting because Soweto at the time was a Muslim country, and they had a very good relationship with the Jews at the time. Most of the Christian maps in that era were unreliable. As his knowledge grew, Henry sent additional expeditions farther and farther from Lisbon. In 1434, one of his fleets was the first to sail beyond the Cape of Bojador, south of Soweto, Morocco. This led to the understanding that the ocean beyond it was navigable. 
It took almost 11 more years for the fleets to reach the Red Cape in West Africa. Now, they didn't take 11 years to sail down. It's just that they went in incrementally. Now, about the same time, the Portuguese were making a revolutionary change in ship design, and it resulted in a new type of ship called the Caravelle. As early as 1441, expeditions from Portugal and other places began to use it. The Mediterranean version of the Caravelle had two masts for sails. The Spanish and Portuguese versions were larger, with three and sometimes four masts, and that's similar to the drawing here. This design made them more suitable for travel in the open ocean. Now, if you laid one of these ships on its side and you put it in this room, it would fit entirely within this room. That gives you an idea of the size of those ships. And these were ships that people went out to sea in for months and months at a time. And you also have to remember there was an old wives' tale, a superstition or a belief at the time that if you sailed out into the world uh, and you went out of sight, the world was flat and you would fall off the edge. You would be lost and never return. Now people go, well, sailors came back. Some did, but many, many never made it back. Bartolomeo Diaz was uh, sailed on a caravel, and he was a captain who was called to service by King John II of Portugal. He was to lead an expedition around Africa in the mid-1440s. Diaz passed the southern tip of Africa to where the coastline continued off to the northeast. He was credited as being the first European to sail to the Cape of Good Hope. He got as far as the mouth of the Great Fish River in South Africa. Diaz originally named the area the Cape of Storms because when he got there, it was very, very windy and stormy. It was later renamed the Cape of Good Hope because the king said it represented the opening of a route to the east. However, Diaz didn't go any further because his crew was afraid of going on and they threatened to mutiny. Diaz yielded to his sailors' demands and returned to Lisbon in 1448. They'd been gone for 16 months. Now, wars between Portugal and Spain over the next uh, several years uh, because of territorial claims by the two countries delayed for future voyages. The conflicts created a big shortage of money uh, that would have been available for exploration. In the meantime, overland routes supported the theory that India was reachable by sea. Portuguese received valuable information from individuals who had just returned from the Far East and the Middle East and that proved to be very useful in their future navigation. The Carrick was another new design ship and using his experience, Bartolomeo Diaz helped with the construction of these boats. Uh, it was larger than a caravel, a little wider than this room is high, not much longer. Uh, it had three masts and carried about 1,200 tons of cargo. The Carrick soon became popular with the Europeans and Columbus sailed originally his first voyage with two caravels and one carrick. Christopher Columbus was an Italian navigator, explorer, and colonizer born in 1451. In the political social climate of the day, Columbus planned to sail west in search of India. He won, his idea won the attention and support of Spain's Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. Columbus's initial voyage in 1492 came at a critical time of growing national imperialism in Europe. Countries were seeking wealth through the establishment of colonies and trade. And there was economic competition between the developing European nation states. Columbus believed that a westward route from Spain to India would be shorter and more direct than the overland route through Arabia. If his theory had been true, it would have allowed Spain direct access to the spice trade then controlled by the Venetians and the Arabs. Uh, the great navigator kind of underestimated the circumference of the earth. On his first voyage, following the blue line, which is his plotted course to the west, he failed to reach India. Instead, he landed in an area uh, that is known today as the Bahamas. He believed he'd reached the in East, in, uh, East India or Asian mainland, uh, and legend has it that he mistakenly referred to the native inhabitants as Indians. But Columbus's voyage across the Atlantic led to European awareness of continents in the Western Hemisphere, though perhaps not the first to reach the Americas. In fact, it's known now he was not the first. 
Columbus initiated widespread contact between Europeans and Native Americans. And you can actually see the, the red outline there is what Columbus thought was going to be the coastline that he would find. Obviously, he didn't realize he was going to run into North America and, and Central America, South America. And after his voyage and the, some of the subsequent voyages, the black line represents what the Spanish cartographers thought was the coastline of the Americas. Vasco da Gama was born around 1460 on the coast of Portugal. He learned mathematics, navigation, and astronomy. And in 1497 was ordered by the king to seek out lands in the east and open markets to Asia. Da Gama was a commander of the first fleet of ships to sail directly from Europe to India. In just over three months, he sailed more than 6,000 miles of open ocean in the Atlantic. The distance covered was three times as far as that traveled by Columbus. It was the longest journey out of the sight of land to that date. When he returned to Portugal in 1499, the king was so pleased with his activities that da Gama was given the title Admiral of the Indian Seas. I kind of like that. Maybe I can get the title Admiral of the Bathtub Duckies. <laughs> Amerigo Vespucci was an Italian explorer, navigator, and cartographer. At the invitation of King Manuel I of Portugal, Vespucci participated in several voyages. He explored the east coast of South America between 1499 and 1504. His first voyage reached South America and continued north into the Caribbean Sea. The continents of the North and South America are generally believed to have derived their name from a fe feminized Latin version of Amerigo's first name. The age of exploration to the New World was dominated by the Spanish conquistadors. They were driven by the three G's, glory, gospel, and gold. Now guess which one to them was most important? Gold. gold, you got it. Anyway, their success in acquiring monopolies on much of the treasure uh, brought great wealth and power to Spain. We'll talk just about a couple of them. At the age of 25, Vasco Nunez de Balboa sailed to South America and Panama. He was the first European to reach the Pacific Ocean overland from Panama, and he claimed it and all the land that it touched for Spain. Now that's a really grandiose kind of a thought when you, when you look at it, because he looked at this body of water, he couldn't see anything other than the immediate coastline, and he said, everything this water touches all over the world belongs to my king. Well, that didn't quite work out that way, but it was a good thought at the time. Anyway, Panama became the marketplace for the Spanish Empire, and it was the third richest colony in the New World. Because of its central location, it was the port of departure for most of Spain's treasure fleets that were laden with gold and silver, as well as some precious uh, gems and some spices. Hernando Cortez was another conquistador, and he was the first uh, who spotted the coast of y Yucatan in Mexico, in the heart of the Mayan Empire. The Mayan king Montezuma sent envoys out to greet the newcomers. But eh, I'm not going to go there because that's another pretty long story. <laughs> From the 16th to the 18th century, the galleon was the favored ship of the Spaniards. The galleons were about 150 feet long and 40 to 50 feet wide. They carried about 600 tons of cargo. They could have carried more, but they were heavily armed. Generally, they were three-masted, and they had two or three gun decks that were deemed necessary for protection. They were used for exploration as well as for conquest. Many galleons did fall prey to pirates who operated with seeming imp impunity in the Caribbean. But many, many more galleons were lost to Atlantic storms, hurricanes, reefs, and just bad seamanship than were ever lost to the pirates. Ferdinand Magellan's most famous voyage began in 1519 with a fleet of five ships and some 237 men. Now, he was a Portuguese explorer who, while in the service of the King of Spain, tried to find a westward route to the Spice Islands of Indonesia. He was the first European to enter the Pacific Ocean via the Strait of Magellan at the tip of South America. Of course, it wasn't called the Strait of Magellan at the time. That happened a couple of years later when the king thought it would be nice to name it after him. Uh, anyway, 
He was the first person to attempt to circumnavigate the globe. He sailed west from Spain, but he only got about two-thirds of the way around the world. Magellan was killed in a battle in the Philippines, but since he had earlier traveled to the east, to the Spice Islands, that's the red line that you can see there, Magellan is considered as to have been one of the very first individuals to have crossed all 24 of the meridians on the globe. Only 18 of his men and one ship of the original five vessels returned to Spain. When they returned home, the crew was immediately arrested by the Spanish Inquisition because their logs were off by one day. Why? They didn't know about the international date line. Nobody did at the time. Nonetheless, they were all convicted of heresy and fraud. In 1728, James Cook was born in Northeast England. He became a sailor, surveyor, cartographer, map maker, and explorer in the Royal Navy. Cook surveyed the St. Lawrence River in Quebec, Canada during the Seven Years' War with France. Amazingly, he did this at night with no light under French guns and in a small open rowboat. Those charts, by the way, are still usable for navigation in the river. There have been some changes because of dredging, but for pretty much his charts are very, very accurate. Ten years later, Captain Cook made one of his most famous journeys. He was given orders by the Royal Navy to observe the transit of Venus across the sun's disk in Tahiti. The transit of Venus was a measurement used to determine the distance from the sun to the earth. Cook was also uh, supposed to explore the southern seas along the way. That was secret orders that he had been given from the Admiralty uh, to do some more work. He left England with 112 officers and men on a 111-foot-long, 35-foot wooden ship. Okay, you can think about that. We're on a ship that's about three times as wide and five times as long, and they didn't have a buffet. They sailed into some of the stormiest seas on Earth and through the uncharted, ice-filled waters of the southern latitudes. Cook recorded and mapped many regions of the South Pacific previously unknown to the Europeans. His voyage lasted for three years and 18 days. And of course, they had no internet, no cell phones, no way to communicate instantly with the people back home. Now, many in the maritime community at the time died of scurvy, but over the entire cruise to Tahiti and back, Cook lost only four men, and just one of those was because of disease. Captain Cook did more than any other man of his time to promote the health of his crew. He used every means possible to provide nu nutritious food uh, for the people. He insisted that they eat sauerkraut to prevent scurvy. He required his men to wash every day and to air out their hammocks. Now, one of the things that was interesting is he actually forced his officers to eat the sauerkraut because he knew that that way his men would also eat the sauerkraut. The officers were probably not real thrilled with that. <laughs> Cook discovered Oahi, as what it was called at the time, in 1778, and we know it, of course, as Hawaii. When he first landed, the islanders believed that Cook was a god because one of their gods was symbolized by a pole with a cross staff and these white curtains hanging down from it that looked very much like the sails on his ship as he entered. As he went ashore, he was wrapped in a sacred red cloth. Now, later on, he departed the island and then his ship was damaged and he had to return for repairs. Guess what? The islanders now knew he was just another guy. He was just a man. He, if he was a god, his ship wouldn't have been damaged, uh, and he wouldn't have had to come back for repairs. Cook's men were stoned, and a small boat from the ship was stolen. He took a chief hostage until the return of that stolen boat, and the Hawaiians attacked. A scuffle broke out, and Cook shot a man with his pistol. The ship's marines fired their muskets, but they didn't have time to reload because the Hawaiians were too close to them. Cook was clubbed from behind and went down. He and four others were killed. James Cook was dismembered and his body was kind of spread about the islands as trophies for the people that were the involved. Now there was another well-known explorer who was named William Bly. At 21 years of age, Bly rose to pretty much historical significance or prominence
because he was the sailing master of HMS Resolution and he was under the command of James Cook on his fateful voyage to Hawaii. Bly received very high praise from Cook, but he also learned from him the ways to keep a crew healthy at sea. Later, much later, Bly became a vice admiral in the British Navy. But Bly is best known for the notorious mutiny during his command of HMS Bounty. In, eight, in 1787, he sailed from England to Tahiti to get breadfruit trees. The English wanted the breadfruit to feed the working slaves in the Caribbean. Well, when they got to Tahiti, the trees weren't really mature enough to be transplanted, so Bly gave his crew liberal shore leave. Aha! This provided them extensive time with the native women, and that contributed to the events that were to come. In 1789, the breadfruit trees were finally ready and they were loaded aboard the ship. Bounty departed Tahiti and headed for the Caribbean. Mutiny broke out shortly after departure and the mutineers wanted to return to Hawaii or to Tahiti to the women they had fallen in love with, married, and in some cases had fathered children. A third of Bounty's crew seized firearms during the night watch. Bly was surprised, captured, and bound. None of the people, which is the other two-thirds probably of the people on the ship, who were loyal to Bly put up any significant struggle. The mutineers provided Bly and 18 of his most loyal crew members with a 23-foot lifeboat. That's not even anywhere close as big as our tenders, by the way, and it was a rowboat. They were given four swords and enough food and water for a few days' travel. Bly was also allowed to take a navigator's tool called a sextant and a pocket watch, but no charts and no compass. This guy was a superb navigator and he made the impossible 3,600 mile long, nautical mile long voyage to Indonesia. After 47 days with only one casualty, Bly reached Timor. Several of his men were, who survived that long trip died of sickness in the Dutch East Indies most likely from malaria. Bly was exonerated at his court-martial over the loss of the bounty. And if you want to talk about that, I can go on for hours. <laughs> He's one of my favorites. In the meantime, the bounty sailed back to Tahiti where it picked up the women and some supplies and a few Tahitian men to help man the ship. They sailed around for a while, ended up at Pitcairn Island where it was burned and sunk. Now in the legal case against the mutineers, crewman Peter Haywood uh, was freed. Fletcher Christian, who never went back to England, was never tried. Now the mutineers themselves had family and friends who had very close royal collection, connections. While the other mutineers were found guilty, most were evident, uh, eventually pardoned by the crown. In spite of what Hollywood really wants us to believe, Bly was a very good captain who treated his men very humanely. You have to think about the way the movies portrayed him. They portrayed him as a drunken despot who caused things to happen. But aboard Bounty, no one was ever flogged nor made to climb to the top mast for a drinking label and ladle and then come back down again for a mouthful of water under the burning tropical sun. None of that ever happened. That was all uh, Hollywood. Following a subsequent mutiny against the Royal Navy in the Thames River, investigators found that all of the sailors in that fleet respected Bly. They said they would sail with him anywhere. Their particular problems, their complaints were against other officers, their food, which was terrible, their pay, and the bad treatment by the Royal Navy, but not against William Bly. At the age of exploration and discovery was now coming to an end. The age of commerce and trade was at hand. Heavily laden and lumbering cargo ships to all points of the globe were sailing. Passengers were impatient. <clears throat> None of us are ever in a hurry, right? Anyway, they were impatient back then, and they wanted to reach their destination in much less time. So what came next? Clipper ships. They achieved popularity in the mid-19th century. The ships were fast, and that was attributed to their multiple mast and many, many sails. But because they were narrow for their length, they had limited bulk cargo carrying capacity. The Dutch-built clipper ships uh, then they began the passenger service with them. They instituted some tea trade with Java in Indonesia. But most of the clipper ships were built in British and American shipyards. 
They sailed on trade routes between the United Kingdom and its colonies, and the clippers were also used in the transatlantic trade and on the New York to San Francisco route during the gold rush, California gold rush, that is. In New York, a newspaper advertised the sailing date of a California-bound ship. Within three hours, it was fully booked. Passengers, and that should be in quotes, paid between six and $11,000 in today's money to have the right to work on the ships. So there were no real passengers, they were just cargo ships. In the early days of the gold rush, it usually took about 200 days for a ship to travel from New York to San Francisco. That's a voyage of more than 16,000 miles. Some attempted to sail from the east coast of the United States to Panama, then go across land across the isthmus and catch a ship on the other side if they could find one that was going to sail up to California and assuming that they had the money to do it. Both routes were expensive, time-consuming, difficult, and often very dangerous. Until the Panama Canal was finished in 1914, rounding South America was the only route uh, that was available by ship. And there was a need to shorten the route to the Pacific, but that need had been discussed by the Spanish as early as the 1600s. With the gold rush, though, uh, talk of the new canal across Panama became even more pan uh, meaningful. There was a huge economic benefit to be gained with the canal across the isthmus, but again, as they say, that's another story. It takes about 45 minutes if you want to hear it. <laughs> In 1851, a clipper ship named the Flying Cloud made the journey around South America in only 89 days. Remember, the normal was 200 days. It was a headline-grabbing world record that would not be broken for, by another sailing vessel until 1989, 138 years later. The Flying Cloud's success is much more noteworthy because its navigator was a woman named Eleanor Creasy. She'd studied oceanographic currents and weather phenomena and astronomy from her childhood in Massachusetts. Now, Eleanor was very much the exception at the time because, among other things, women were considered to be bad luck when they were part of a ship's crew. Now, I guess it didn't hurt very much that her father was also the owner and captain of the ship. <laughs> the Cuddy Sark is a British clipper ship that was built in 1869 as a merchant vessel. She was the fastest of any ship of that size in her day. She sailed until 1919 when her fat mast broke at the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. Later, she was restored to her original sail configuration and used as a training vessel. She went on public display in 1954 in Greenwich, England. The Cuddy Sark was badly damaged in 2007 by a fire while undergoing restoration. Initial reports that came out as a result of that fire indicated that the damage was extensive with most of its wooden structure having been lost. Fortunately, nearly all of her rigging and fittings have been removed to storage and they were off the ship and therefore they were undamaged and restoration efforts have resumed, uh, but I don't know for sure if they've set a date yet when she'll be reopened to the public. A new invention would soon dramatically alter the way the ships were built and the way they were operated. The era of steam was about to begin as the glory days of sail came to an end. Most of the old sailing vessels were grounded, abandoned, scrapped, or sunk. Now, my next presentation will be announced in your evening currents. It won't be about ships. I think the next one's about New Zealand, the land of that furry little bird. And then the one after that, we'll talk some more about ships. Anyway, this lecture will repeat on your stateroom television on Channel 9. Uh, and coming up next here in the lounge in about, oh, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, is Terry Bishop. Uh, he's going to talk about Bound for Botany Bay, and it's the first part of a two-part series about the uh, transportation of convicts to Australia. I'd like to thank you. You can meet me later today out in Breestas. I'm going to stay and listen to Terry, uh, but you can meet me out in Breestas later today, and we can talk about this or anything else, any of the talks, last cruise, next cruise, this cruise, whatever. I'd be happy to join with you. And anyway, have a wonderful day, and I'll see you later on. Thank you.